slavery and credit, two seemingly entirely different fields historically tied together thanks to one extraordinary man. Dun & Bradstreet is the oldest credit bureau. In 2020, the company reported over $1.7 billion in revenue. Click on the company's website under our company, then our history, and we confirm the founder of the firm is Lewis Toppin. Missing from Dun & Bradstreet's history is that founder Lewis Toppin was one of the most ardent abolitionists in history devoting his life to ending slavery. It's no coincidence that four presidents, all against slavery, worked for him. This is Origin Stories, Credit Bureaus. One of 10 siblings, Lewis Tappan left his home in Northampton at the age of 15. His father, a shopkeeper, and another eight of his 10 siblings are remembered as unremarkable. A self-taught businessman, Tappan eventually set up shop in Philadelphia. During the War of 1812, 25-year-old Lewis found himself with a large inventory of British goods newly banned as imports. In one year, as a war profiteer, he netted $75,000, an enormous amount of money at the time. Tappan, the religious Calvinist, was rich. He became an investor and philanthropist. At the same time, Lewis's brother, Arthur, went bust trying to start a business in Montreal. Lewis lent Arthur $12,000 to open shop as a silk wholesaler in New York City in 1815. Lewis himself went broke a decade later after investing in mills and a nail factory. The 1826 recession wiped him out. The following year, he moved to New York to join Arthur's silk business. The Tappans were primarily wholesalers selling soaps to merchants who would bring the goods back to one-room stores throughout the U.S. It was a profitable business. Strong evangelicals, the brothers only hired religious clerks. Bachelors lived in religious dorms, were forbidden to drink, and had to be in bed by 10 p.m. As part of their religious upbringing, the Tappan brothers believed strongly in equality. Customers were treated the same and offered the same price, no matter their background, an unusual arrangement at the time. All sales were cash only, no credit allowed. Besides insisting their employees live by Christian ideals, their brothers wanted everybody else to do the same. Due to corruption, people were unwilling to report brothels, gambling calls, opium dens, and the like to the police. So, instead, they retort them to Lewis or Arthur, who'd work with the police to shutter them. They eventually developed a secret network of morality police around New York City. One day, prominent abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison showed up to speak with Arthur. Garrison had recently been released from jail, where he'd spent six months rather than apologize for insulting a slavery proponent. Arthur was converted to the cause of abolition. The Tappan brothers refocused their energy towards what they saw as the gravest offense against God of any, slavery. Garrison formed the American Anti-Slavery Society, described as quote-unquote, free blacks and rich whites. The Tappan brothers fell solidly into the latter category. Lewis took up the cause with zeal, bringing a whip with him to lectures that he'd cracked to illustrate the evil of slavery. He advocated widespread interracial marriage, so all people would eventually be the same race. Lewis railed against Southerners in the South. All this went over poorly with her Southern customers, who labeled the brothers, quote unquote, leaders in the crusade against white people. The Tappan brothers' response, they doubled down. Their business was boycotted, their homes firebombed, and they were followed by angry mobs, often led by pro-slavery clergy. Lewis received a package with a black man's severed ear, and the South Carolinian pledged $100,000 to anybody who'd kidnap Arthur. He responded sarcastically that if they paid first, he'd kidnap himself. The brothers were unflappable. As boycotts became worse, Arthur was forced to offer credit to attract more customers. He extended repayment terms for ever longer periods and, due to his religious beliefs, did not charge interest. The 1837 financial crisis led to a string of defaults, leaving Arthur owing $1.1 million to his own creditors, an amount comparable to owing a billion dollars today. Rather than declare bankruptcy, 
Arthur managed to pay off the debts, though it left the business in dire shape. In 1841, Lewis wrote to a cousin, At 53, I find myself worth nothing. At the time, the life expectancy for American men was just under 40 years old. However, the financial meltdown gave Lewis an idea. Was it possible, he wondered, to repurpose his morality spy network to help decide if a customer is likely to repay their bills? <laughs> Recapping. The Tappan brothers were ardent, evangelical, abolitionist, wholesale silk merchants. Facing boycotts, they extended credit freely. Then a financial crisis left them dead broke. Lewis Tappan wondered if he could repurpose his morality spies to help determine what would become a noun, creditworthiness. Initially, Lewis shared his reports for free with others. However, eventually he realized he could sell the reports, that they held value. Quote, in prosperous times, they will be able to pay for the information, and in bad times, they feel they must have it, he wrote to his nephew. In 1841, at age 53, Lewis created the world's first credit bureau, the Mercantile Agency. Simultaneously, he didn't slow down at all on abolition. While launching his startup, he funded and helped raise awareness about a group of kidnapped Africans who had taken over the slave ship, the Amistad, and were eventually captured and imprisoned. At an age where most people were retired or dead, Lewis was working to launch the mercantile agency and secure the release of the kidnapped Africans. He succeeded, and it wasn't long before he was wishing the Africans goodbye as they set sail back to Africa. Tappan faced two challenges, finding customers and also finding reporters, spies who could send accurate credit reports. He had the morality network, but that was limited to New York City. Lewis turned to his network of abolitionists and abolition supporters. One of his early reporters was an Illinois lawyer, Abraham Lincoln. Later correspondence included Civil War General and future President Ulysses S. Grant and Presidents Grover Cleveland and William McKinley, all slavery opponents. Lewis asked reporters to collect net worth and business information, but tended to focus more on moral character, likely due to his own repeat failures in business that were eventually paid back. On paper, Lewis and Arthur were terrible credit risks with their multiple failed businesses. In reality, he and his brother always paid back creditors. Even with his strong Christian morality, Lewis focused more on perceived character flaws that could affect business. Drunkenness and gambling were considered dangerous, whereas adultery wasn't unless it strained a potential debtor's income by forcing him to set up a mistress and family in a separate house. Lewis launched the Mercantile Agency on August 1st, 1841. Business was slow, and by January 1942, Tappan only attracted 33 clients, and then only after lowering his rates. He pounded cement relentlessly, and eventually the idea caught on. By 1844, he had 280 clients and 300 correspondents. With his successful business, Lewis rescued Arthur financially, much like Arthur had rescued him in the past. He branched out to open offices in Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. The business was repeatedly sued for defamation and evasion of privacy, winning some and losing some cases. Eventually, they won the right to report if the reports were in good faith. Tappan sold the business to his clerk, Benjamin Douglas, who eventually gave it to his brother-in-law, Robert Graham Dunn. His name would go on to become a verb, meaning to bill collect. Dunn switched from focusing on moral character to evaluating raw figures using the latest statistical method to predict the likelihood of credit default. He also renamed the firm R.G. Dunn and Company. In 1855, John Bradstreet opened a competing credit reporting business. The two firms, Dunn's and Bradstreet's, competed heavily for years. In 1933, with the Depression making business challenging for both, they merged and changed the name to Dunn and Bradstreet. Dunn and Bradstreet went on to expand nationally and internationally, with competitors popping up that focused on different aspects of credit, especially individual non-business consumer credit. Tappan's innovation, the Credit Bureau, has become a core part of the financial world. Tappan's abolition work was not popular with many of his credit customers. To this day, 180 years after the firm was founded, 
Dun and Bradstreet avoids mentioning the early ties to abolition. We wrote asking why and received no response.